All righty. All right, now, so we sort of finish our layers of doctrine here. And the main thing is, okay, now, everything that we're putting in the secondary area, say, now go back to your churches and update your doctrinal statement, okay? <laughs> um, because literally it means if you don't, that means you're saying it's open for debate, okay? And because uh, you haven't made it a rule of faith for your church and for the people there. But, but people won't attend. Well, is church for Christians or for non-Christians? There's your question. Is this for believers who understand the Word of God? This is part of our community. And see, and it goes back to, well, what's success in ministry? Does it really mean numbers? Say, I mean, uh, you might know at the end of Jesus' ministry, how many followers did he have? Yeah, but he was the most faithful uh, anywhere that you could ever have. So, yeah, our success in ministry is, is basically has to be defined by what we can control, and that's faithfulness. Uh, and growth, th that's God's business, you know, regenerating hearts, drawing people, uh, all of that. But to see, if you're, you're defining your success based on numbers and things you can't control and whether or not you're really going to say, is, you know, was it me? Uh, was it, you know, all these things? Are you saying, look, is, is God involved here? Or I'm a flop because I don't have a 3,000 member or a 1,000 member church. You know, handful of people, you know, 12 apostles changed the world. Uh, so, you know, why? Because they continue to multiply themselves. So it's quality over quantity. I mean, that's, you know, that's real uh, growth. It has to be doctrinal and qualitative growth. So, so that said, in, in practice, like I said, I, I, unfortunately, you haven't seen the fallout that I've seen in these areas. So uh, uh, not only for the fact that I've seen church splits, but I also see people living minimalist Christian lives. They're not very mature because uh, they they're not, haven't really grown a lot thinking about these things. And it's, a, it's just a very weak kind of Christianity to be in. It's like the church, it's all about evangelism all the time. You know, every week, you know, you, you, tr you, you preach evangelistic sermons. Yeah, but how are you growing the people to maturity? You, know, you end up with some fervent people who are basically, they're 40 years old in the faith and they're still wearing a diaper in the helmet of salvation. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just, um, so I just, uh, yeah. Yeah, my illustrations, I mean, even my cat laughs at my illustrations. Uh, one thing that is clear is God did not give me with the, the gift of art. So uh, that's, uh, that's definitely true. So even my stick figures look bad. So, um, so I just leave that alone. I, I leave that area for <laughs> other people who are far more gifted or actually have a gift in that area. Uh, so, all right. Move on now. So you've got your categories now. Now we're going to move forward. We should have about enough time to cover what we need to cover here. And um, look at um, page 28. Now we're going to apply these definitions uh, and these, these levels to how our groups manifest and what we call them. Okay? Because here's the terms that we normally use to describe groups that claim to have certain doctrine. Church, denomination, sect, and cult. Okay. And so how does this work? Well, first you have to decide whether you're dealing with a sociological issue or a theological issue. So sociology, what is this religion's place in culture? Is really looking at its behavior, manifestation, place in culture. Um, where theological definitions are just that. They're defined by, is it essential doctrine, secondary doctrine, third level doctrine? What, what's the real issue here? Uh, so start with sociological definitions. I'm going to paraphrase here some of for sake of time. Church is the mainstream religion in the culture, the established mainstream religion. So in America, still by a, you know, <laughs> it's not overwhelming anymore, but at least by majority, the church is still Christianity, okay? But you go to uh, Saudi Arabia, what's, quote, the church, you know, Islam, particularly a certain kind, you know, Wahhabi Islam. But uh, see, so point is, that doesn't tell you whether it's true or false, right or wrong. It just tells you what's established. So while sociology 
is helpful in a number of ways. It's an is discipline, not an ought discipline. Uh, I can't tell you the way things ought to be. It can only describe relations of religion and culture, which are very helpful in many ways. Uh, but it just can't tell you whether it's right or wrong. Now, note that a denomination is really, say, let, let's say you've got a culture, let's say Christianity is the established religion. Well, what's a denomination? Look at the second definition there. Denominational society, a number of parallel denominations comprise the great majority and represent the society's uh, established religion. So, so in other words, in America, it used to be, which by the way, again, founding fathers' time, you know, 17, 1780s and so forth. The fact is, look, you, you've surveyed those who were in America. It was like 98.8% self-identified as Christian. You're not making a statement whether they're born again or this or that. But he asked them what their religious affiliation was. It'd be Christian, okay? And of that, um, what do you have? I mean, literally, of that 98%, right, here's this, um, about 5% were Roman Catholic, okay? And the rest were basically all Protestants okay, at the time. And of that, you think about it, you know, you start saying, all right, well, roughly... 70 to 80 percent had roots in Calvinism at some point, whether it was Presbyterianism. And remember, at that point, why? Because there's lots of Episcopalian, Anglican, but that's when they were had their 39 articles Calvinistic statement. It's changed since then. So, yeah, but you've got Lutheran, you've got, you know, Baptist, you've got all these other ones. But, you know, and even on this side, you'd have, you know, Episcopalian, you know, Presbyterian and so forth. That's supposed to say Presbyterian, even though it's written in Akkadian. So, so that's the, you know, so again, as you're dividing it up, now, of course, all sorts of things change over the years, and uh, I don't want to get too much into the history and migration of the culture. See, but this is why back then you could have a quote-unquote United States, because people came from the same basic worldview and presuppositions. And right now we've got, what, atheists, pagans, postmodernists, skeptics, you know, evangelicals, and so forth. We're not united in our ultimate ideologies and beliefs. So, so anyway, the po point of parallel denominations is, look, here's clearly the majority, major, you know, majority religion, which is Christianity, but it's made up of Congregationalists, Presbyterians, you know, Reformed, Baptists, Lutherans. You know, that's a denominational society. Now, what's a prerequisite to having a denominational society? That's all I hear up here. I see Christian. So, come on, man. A little clarity. So, what? Well, you do, but if you had the Church of England, was that a Christian society? Yeah, you have to have religious liberty. Yeah. See, that's a prerequisite to, to having a denominational society, is essentially you, you, know, you pretty much can't have an established church that's going to persecute and, uh, you know, get rid of all the other competitors. So, and that's why it's been, um, at least now it's not that rare, but you go to the Middle East, guess what? You know, uh, now we still got religious pluralism, you know, for the vast majority of America, we didn't have religious pluralism. It was still Christianity, but you now since the 1960s, roughly, that's when we're starting to see true religious pluralism as opposed to a denominational pluralism uh, here, which is why we have more conflicts today than we've ever had before. But uh, so here, so that, that's really a denominational society, a sect is basically a religious body that's separated from larger denominations. A cult, again, sociologists really won't use the word cult anymore, at least the good ones, uh, because they know they're supposed to be descriptive, not prescriptive, or make normative statements. So this is where you're going to hear terms like founder religion, new religious movement, uh, or something of that sort, as opposed to cult. Uh, so, so what's a founder religion or a new religious movement? No, it's just that. It's something new in the culture. That's not part of the established religion or denominational you know, structure. And say sociologically, for example, 
back in the 1960s, this is where we started to see the influx more and more of Eastern religion coming to America. So we had our hippie movements going on, and yeah, there we saw you know the Krishna movement, the transcendental meditation groups coming over. But take the Krishnas, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So you had A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada come over from India and uh, get off the plane, you know, go to Central Park and start chanting in his shaved head and orange robe. The hippies are there going, wow, man, you know, so you know, let's chant and the, the Krishna movement's born. And, you know, the more of this is gaining ground, you know, people are, you know, le the, the kids who are in there, you know, now, see, that's the second stage. See, now you have liberal churches that have the facade of a Christian morality and Christian structure. See, now you went from orthodoxy to liberalism and say, you know, liberalism didn't really satisfy. It's sort of this moralistic, you know, authoritarian structure, at least in classic liberalism. So now I want some free spirituality. So people are trying the new religions and the alternative religions. So... So that's where, you know, I see, as you see a culture that's disintegrating and decaying in a post-Christian world, it usually goes orthodoxy, liberalism, and then alternative religions, and then atheism and skepticism. Uh, and you're going to see a, a, an admixture of that kind of stuff at the end. So uh, in the end, though, new religious movement, you know, point is, is that Krishna worship is just an, another orthodox form of Hinduism. Okay. that's now out of its place in India and in America where it's a minority or new religion. So, but literally, it's just an orthodox form of Hinduism. We took uh, your local church, got a crane, and all the people dropped in the middle of Saudi Arabia. You'd be the, the cult, okay, the new religious movement there. So again, it's relativistic. It's relative to the culture. So... And again, definitions of cults, um, I, I, I cover this in my Cults of America class. Um, which, by the way, before I go any further here, a couple of, several of you have asked me about the books for the fall semester. They're the same as the books for the uh, fall 2012 semester. So if you look at the ECD course outlines, you can get those. There's really two you're going to need. Uh, Culver's Biblical View of Civil Government and then Jeffries, Pierce for Our Transgressions. So Culver's for ECD-1 in the fall, uh, Jeffries for ECD-2. Uh, so you can do that. And then, uh, again, part of the goal, too, is eventually develop some more of these uh, distance learning versions of our courses that I, you know, we teach. One of them would be, you know, Cults of America or Demonology and the Occult, Juridical Apologetics, things like that, is to eventually develop that. But on a cult, See, if, if you hear anybody in the news use the word cult, it's not in a theological way. It's in a sociological way. A religion that's outside the mainstream of the dominant religious form of the given culture. Now, you really think about that. What does it take now in modern America to be a religion that's outside the mainstream? The people go, wow, that's weird. <laughs> now, I mean, come on. We have homosexual churches that are supposedly acceptable in the culture now. Uh, we've got, it's really difficult to get anything anymore that's a cult. But this is one of those crossovers between law and religion. To get a religion that's unacceptable now to the culture and is really kind of freaky and weird, you really, there has to be some sort of crime that's associated with the religion. I am, and that's why, see, what's the weird stuff? See, right now, you know, in 1997, there was this uh, UFO cult, the uh, Heaven's Gate group. And, you know, it's a small number of people, about 42 members of the group. And now all of a sudden they're all over the news because there's this mass suicide. 39 of the 42 committed suicide. Why? Because the founders, they call themselves Bo and Peep. Uh, I kid you not. Yeah, the, the, the founder's name was really named Marshall Applewhite. Uh, he claimed he was the reincarnation of the space alien that was Jesus 2,000 years ago. And he came back to help people advance and evolve to the next stage beyond human. Um, you know, but eventually what they're going to have to do is uh, you know, get off this planet, leave their bodies. And uh, so uh, eventually the sign was there's going to be some special sign from the aliens or hence the gods. And the special sign at that time back in 1997 is the Hale-Bopp comet was near the Earth. So that was the signal, according to Bo, uh, is that, see, there's a spaceship, 
an invisible spaceship that's hidden in the tail of a hale -Bopp comet. And what they had to do now was beam up. And so, but to do that, they had to commit suicide to leave their body. And then they'd get in the spaceship uh, that'd be in the tail of the hale -Bopp comet. You see, so now you know why it was a very small cult, okay? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to get people to commit to that kind of an idea, so it stayed relative. Plus, I'll, I gotta do what? I gotta commit suicide eventually? Nah, you know, <laughs> I'll try Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, that's, uh, you know, okay, you know, I'll, I'll try something else, right? So, so you know, and then everybody's, you know, it's a cult, it's a cult. Or um, you look at, you know, very important I think about the multiple, you know, uh, types of Mormonism. What was in, been in the news recently, um, which the mainstream Utah church hates, the fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, FLDS, the Warren Jeffs, uh, you know, group. These are the ones where, again, you want to see pre-1890 Mormonism, that's FLDS, okay? That's the way it was before the, when the Army, U.S. armies were going to Utah, or, you know, the Deseret territories to kick out the Mormons for their polygamy because they were disobeying the, uh, uh, the uh, territorial court order. It can't practice polygamy anymore. All of a sudden, the prophet had a new revelation that they couldn't practice polygamy anymore. Um, and all the ones who said, wait a minute, the Mormon church is going liberal. Joseph Smith said it, I believe it, and that settles it. We're practicing polygamy. So all these, you know, different groups split off now. And so now we're going to continue to practice what Joseph Smith, the prophet, told us to do. So, you know, so they continue to practice polygamy and trying to become God and all that. So FLDS. But see, this was, I mean, besides the fact that what? In, in these cases, you've got these, you know, 14, 15-year-old brides uh, and things like that. So what you've got is basically pedophilia going on. Uh, you've got all sorts of things going on that, fortunately, today, pedophilia is still against the law, uh, still considered socially unacceptable. Uh, but, you know, uh, the Elizabeth Smart case from about a decade ago, that was an F, you know, not Warren Jeffs, but another guy who was part of some, uh, you know, polygamous uh, Mormon group. I wanted to reestablish that. So this is where, you know, to get to that, you get to the issue of, you know, what's illegal religion? Right. At some point, it's even morally unacceptable, but at some point, there are things that are clearly illegal. And I've, you know, I've uh, papers, writings I've presented on what, what are the limits of the First Amendment free exercise clause. There are clear limits to that, and, uh, and again, for good reasons. So, so that's a little bit when you think about sociological cult. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it, now it's really hard to get outside the mainstream of American religious culture, but to do that, you really have to do some kind of crime and what you know or or something that's grossly immoral that's not yet been enacted as a crime so all right so that's the um that's that theological side it's actually pretty easy to uh, understand what's the church read the definition here the universal church is a group of orthodox believers as opposed to heretics which are united in common Identity, origin, central doctrine, purpose, lordship. In other words, everyone united on this, the essentials. Technically, that's what we mean by the church, the universal church. Okay? That's how we use the term the church. Now, denomination, uh, look at the uh, second definition there. Denominational heritage normally includes doctrinal, experiential, or organizational emphases also, ethnicity, language, social class, geographical origin, so forth. Doctrinal and experiential emphases like this, 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 okay? You know, that's really, you know, anything that has to do with how you actually practice Christianity, when necessarily so, you're going to take certain views on that, and then you'll have associations of those churches that agree, okay? And... That's part of our problem now as, as independent, fundamental, or evangelical churches is we're not united uh, in many senses, and so we can't pool our resources like the old denominations did. Um, this is why, uh, you know, anybody here in medicine? Uh, yeah, if you're in medicine, you'll note that um, most of the hospitals that originally built in this country and still a good portion of today have the name Presbyterian, Methodist, you know, Lutheran, something on it. Why? Because 
The problem with our cultural fundamentalism, I'm going to talk about in a minute, is they reduce Christianity to only being a gospel message. Now, when we're fighting for our lives, trying to preserve the faith against, faith against liberalism, yeah, we've got to preserve the essence of Christianity. See, the problem is with the fundamental churches is they stayed with only the essence. We haven't really returned to Protestant orthodoxy, which saw Christianity, it begins with a gospel message, but it's, enti it's an entire way of living and thinking about the entire universe. Say so Christianity encompasses everything in life, not just you know, passing out tracts on the four spiritual laws and becoming a Christian. See, and that was pre-liberal Protestant orthodoxy. Issue, no, we're, we're here to live as entire communities, families, churches, and individuals for Christ, the way we're we understand we're supposed to live. Now that means what? See, the Protestant doctrine of vocation or calling, okay? Everyone has a calling. That would include if you're a doctor, nurse, engineer, uh, baker, whatever it happened to be. The point was there's a way to glorify the true and the living God in doing that particular calling. And just in doing ministry in the church, two basic divisions in doing ministry. There's what the elders were supposed to do, and there's what the deacons were called to do, diaconate, okay? Remember the, in the book of Acts, where the apostles, you know, they're waiting on tables going, what are we doing? We point some people to wait on the tables and help the poor and feed the poor and do whatever we're going to do. We've got to be about preaching and teaching the gospel. So hence, you know, we divide the teaching ministry from the diaconate, helping people, um, taking care of people's temporal needs and things like that. Well, when you think about what it means to, uh, you know, take care of the widow and the orphan, uh, to care for those who are ill. See, that became part of, you know, a helper ministry of the church. How, so now individually, none of us can build a hospital and run it but get, or train people to become an MD or an RN or something like that. But collectively, and this is where we went back to you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, what they do. For a Christian community, we needed a Christian law school. We need a Christian medical school. We need Christian engineering schools. We need all these things that are connected with the Word of God. So, and at the same time, the denominations, through the collective tithing, could nationalize a diaconate ministry. So no one church could ever build a teaching hospital, but guess what? An entire denomination can put a few million bucks to do that. So why? So that the people called to be doctors could go get trained at our schools and then have a place to go to work in the Presbyterian, Methodist, whatever hospital as a calling and help take care of people. Say, so, this is what we used to do as Christians, and now what do we have? You know, <laughs> we're back to doing this. Okay, so, and then we kind of hope the rest of the stuff works out instead of having a comprehensive way of, of, of understanding the Christian life and calling and vocation. And we've really gone back to a pre-Reformation view of calling where only, quote-unquote, priests and pastors have callings. Uh, that's just not true. Everyone's got a calling. And, you know, you're supposed to glorify God whether you're butcher, baker, candlestick maker. And the pastor's got to do his, his, but guess what? Yours is just as important to uh, uh, advance the sciences, do art, uh, again, there's a logical order to it. You're not going to know how to do it as a Christian unless you're equipped to do it uh, doctrinally and every other way. And that's also, too, why we need, used to be the pastors were a lot more educated because, see, how do I disciple an MD to help them understand their calling and how to be a Christian doctor? And not that, you know, well, see, I have a box of tracts in my office, right? No, really, I mean, what, what's the godly function of being a healer, Okay. And how does that fit theologically in our Christian worldview and, and Christian theological uh, concepts? So, do you hear the voice? Okay, good. So, only one of you, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so. Um, yeah, I, I'm listening to him. Oh, 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 oh. I mean, they, they spent like $15 million on this building. They couldn't have spent five grand on some insulation between the walls. I mean... <laughs> Really? I mean, it's like, come on, people. So, anyway, I, yeah. All right, so.
Godly, and see, that's right, you know, how do we make sure people aren't distracted, you know, by uh, this stuff? All right, so, so that's the church denomination. Uh, a sect, again, you read the basic definition of a sect. Um, a sect, oftentimes a denomination and a sect is used interchangeably. But in a more technical sense, a sect is one that really divides on a third level doctrine and makes it a point of fellowship, okay? So now all first three levels, church denomination sect assumes they believe essential Christian doctrine, but there are further organizational divisions among the groups. You know, we're the talk to the demon spiritual warfare church, you know. And if you don't believe that, you can't be in fellowship here with the other three of us who are in the church. So, uh, you know, <laughs> or whatever, so. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's really the sect. They tend to be small. Uh, you know, they, they make, a, make something a point of fellowship that probably should be a point of indifference or, you know, something you could debate, a uh, debatable issue. And um, uh, so now you get to the last one here. Um, this is the one that's most important is what is a cult theologically? Well, long and short of it is a cult is a group of heretics, okay, who claim to be Christian. Um, so these would be those who are not really true Christians now. So what is a cult of Christianity? It's a group of people claiming to be Christian who embrace a particular doctrinal system taught by an individual leader, group of leaders, or organization which system denies, either explicitly or implicitly, one or more of the essential doctrines of the Christian faith as taught in the 66 books of the Bible. Okay? So that's my, that's my working definition for my Cults of America class. Um, why cult of Christianity? Well, because it's far more clear than calling it a non-Christian cult or a Christian cult. If you call it a Christian cult, it sounds oxymoronic, right? Well, is it Christian or is it a cult? Okay. Uh, so you're going to give mis mixed signals where cult of something indicates that there is a world religion, a parent religion, a host religion, where and there's definable criteria for that host religion, parent or host religion. So you know, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, which corresponds to some of the main worldviews that are out there. But what's interesting about the cult phenomena where they claim to be part of that religion but then deny an essential doctrine of it, um, that's really, in the end, unique to Christianity. We've got tons of cult groups that claim all sorts of things that reject essential Christian doctrine, but still claim to be Christian. Where do you find someone who says, you know, I believe in the Trinity and the deity of Christ, and Christ is a God-man, and salvation by grace, and the bodily resurrection, and I'm a Muslim, okay? <laughs> you know, or I'm a Hindu, or I'm, you know, you just don't find that in the other religions. You have sect sectarianism, denominationalism, you know, Islam, whether it's a Sunni, Sufi, Shiite, whatever it happened to be, they believe in the five pillars of Islam. They hold that Muhammad's the prophet. The Quran is the, you know, is, is Allah's, you know, revelation. Now, yet they're going to hold to the essentials. So what you get are denominational or sectarian differences. In Hinduism, same thing, you know, or Buddhism. Look at Hinduism. You basically have two kinds. You have Brahmanistic and Tantric Hinduism. But again, you just, they're all basically pantheism and reincarnation and good and bad karma. You know, the question is, is how you're sort of putting it together. That's more of a sectarian or a denominational difference. Or same thing with the Buddhist, large vehicles, small vehicles, Zen Buddhist, whatever it happens to be. They don't deny the essentials of Buddhism. So again, it's a phenomenon that really is not completely unique to Christianity, but it's the most common in Christianity. Uh, so, so again, it's a cult of something that you're claiming to be part of this parent or host religion. And it's a group of people. How big does the group have to be? Well, the largest of the cults of Christianity would be the, you know, the, the mothership in Salt Lake City, okay? It claims 13 million members right now. They claim 60,000 full-time active missionaries. Uh, so. So for them, um, that's the largest. Jehovah Witnesses claim about the same number. Um, now you can question those statistics too, because if you're ever a member of the Mormon Church, 
it's hard to get your name off the rolls where they stop counting you. You have to go through a formal process. The Jack Mormons that stop attending, you know, they're still counted on the rolls. So uh, th those numbers are definitely inflated. Uh, and I've heard mixed reviews on whether or not all the people baptized for the dead in their temples are added as new Mormons. Uh, I've heard they baptized Elvis a few years ago. I don't know. But um, so, of course, he never died. So maybe it's true. So, uh, but see, there's the largest. But technically, um, all you need for a cult is two, right? You know, one leader, one follower, and you have a small cult, okay? Then I'll send you out on campus here and... Uh, evangelize and uh, within an hour, you know, you each get one new follower, so now you're four. So you just, you're the fastest growing religion in the world now because you doubled in size in one hour, okay? <laughs> so there's your claim to fame. Uh, point is it can be large, can be small. Uh, again, there's lots and lots of different groups out there. Uh, Mormons, JWs, they're the largest. Uh, the smaller ones, you know, like, uh, you know, Heaven's Gate had 42 members. Three didn't get the memo. They were off somewhere when they got the instructions to commit suicide. Um, I, I was doing some research back in uh, early 90s. Uh, Dr. Gomes, who edited the series, the Zondervan Guide to Cults and Religious Movements, um, he had asked me to co-write a book on the uh, UFO cults and the Arantia book for the series. Uh, how many of you know Ken Samples as a professor here? Yeah, Ken uh, and I have been friends for a long time. And uh, back then, he was asked to write the book, and some things happened with him at CRI, so he thought he couldn't finish it. So uh, Dr. Gomes said, well, can you co-write it with him, help him finish? And both of us did cult ministry, and we thought about this stuff. Yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. And then, so we sort of accepted it because we both did cult ministry. And then we had a problem because... Um, one, we started looking for sources on this, and there just weren't a whole bunch of sources on UFO cults everywhere. So we're going all over the place, going to these cult headquarters, looking at these wild-eyed people trying to, you know, sell us into the cult. So we're collecting this stuff, and plus the other thing was, is besides there's nothing available, is um, we, of course, you know, the first time we sat down, we, we both looked at each other and said, realize our academic careers are over because we're going to be known as UFO experts now. <laughs> uh, you know, so after this, we'll have to do UFOs and Bigfoot books and, you know, other, you know, uh, things like that. So we're, we're just done, man. We, we better be careful. So, so thank, thank the good Lord that uh, we missed our deadline. They, went and, they didn't want to extend our deadline. So uh, I didn't get known as a UFO expert, uh, you know, so that was good. But some of these cults, when I was, you know, researching them, I kid you not, I came across this one. It was in Brooklyn, New York, and it was the followers of the prophet Jimbo. Uh, and they already had 12 people in the group. They met in some storefront in Brooklyn, New York. And all the UFO cults are about the same. It's always Jesus was some space alien, uh, you know, and that they're the reincarnation of the, you know, whoever Jesus was back then. So they're around today, but they're all relatively small. So again, it's, and it's everything in between. Uh, key is, you know, they claim to be Christian. They have a particular doctrinal system. The doctrinal system is, is the important thing because there are groups out there that are philanthropic groups that have nothing, they don't make doctrinal statements. They don't make religious statements. So like the, you know, the Elks Lodge or the Kiwanis or um, something like that, they just don't make any doctrinal statements. And then you have others that do. Uh, now, this is important, though, that we look at a group. It has to make a doctrinal statement. But there's an important distinction here. I know most of you have heard of the Masonic Lodge. Okay. And Masonic Lodge, um, and you've probably, there's all sorts of stuff that goes through the Christian church about some of these groups. Uh, you know, Masons are, you know, they get, there's, they get lots of press. And, of course, they're, the, you know, everything that goes on in the world, it must be the Masons. Uh, you know, it's something to do with it. But the reality behind it is, look, the Masons are secret society deists. That's who they are. They're, their basic beliefs are deistic. But how many have heard at some point that at the highest levels, Masons secretly worship the devil? Yeah, almost everybody in the church has heard something like that. And I went to law school I've been teaching here for 10 years when I finally decided to go to law school. And 
one of the guys I came buddies with was a Mason. He's a non-Christian Mason, but he's a contractor and everything. And he just said, look, can you tell your friends to stop saying we worship the devil? Man, we're just kind of tired of that stuff. Because um, really, I mean, it's true that, you know, we, we tend to be, you know, pass this stuff along. If you look at masonry and what it represents, and most of you will recognize this as, recognize this as the symbol of masonry, you know, you know, how many have seen that as the Masonic symbol? Yeah. Why? Because this is your architect's tools, the square and the compass. Okay. And the G stands for Gautu, great architect of the universe. So it's really what's going on. The real history of masonry is they, they, they get started during the Enlightenment period. Um, Again, trying to talk about new ideas when, you know, certain churches are in place, you know, that you could be put to death for having false ideas, so they had to meet secretly. They already had their secret societies formed, so they tended to be not just contractors' guilds now, so now was a place where people could come in the secret society and come and talk. But essentially what they were is they were deists, they're secret society deists. So, and again, there, there's a lot to say about the Masonic Lodge, but, you know, but the key is that even though they use the Bible, they claim to use every religious book. And uh, so for them, it's remember that while cult of Christianity is a false religion, not every false religion is a cult of Christianity. Okay. And so deism is a false religion. It's insufficient. Believing that God made the world and there's some natural moral law is just in, it's insufficient religion. Uh, it's not enough. And that's why being a Mason and a Christian, to actually follow it, you have to go in and say, you know, to the uh, entered apprentice and say, I'm in darkness seeking light and go through all these things. Eventually, be go in, become a master Mason. Then you decide whether to go to the Scottish Rite or the York Rite. Scottish Rite's most popular in the United States. Supposedly you can get 32nd degree Masons. Uh, then you can become a Shriner and ride around with a fez and a cool go-kart in the parade. And uh, um, Whereas at each level, you're le supposedly learning some new secret about life and reality and what you know, truth and religion is about. Now the question is, so where in the heck did all that secret Satan stuff come from? Um, just FYI, um, Albert Pike and 19th century Masonic, probably the most famous 19th century Mason, wrote a book called Morals and Dogmas. Uh, and he's pretty much a self-professed philosopher and thinker and everything else. And he has this, you know, six, 700 page book. I forgot how big it is. I have a copy of it. But the thing is, is here, there's literally two paragraphs in this work which remember that he's not a guru of Mason. Every lodge, a grand lodge, whatever, is independent. And there, really, there aren't any really dogmas. Like Albert Pike wasn't the pope of Masonry, okay? He couldn't declare ex everything that was true about Masonry. It was his opinion. The whole point is, is that there's two paragraphs where he talks about a Luciferian level of knowledge. Uh, the word Lucifer just means light bearer, where you're basically the most enlightened. And so...
It is, so, so. Happy to add some excitement. All right. A little you. louder so the mic will pick it up now, now that the battery is working. All right, thank you, gentlemen. So the Holy Spirit has left the building, okay? So, all right. No. <laughs> oh, boy. No. Yeah, no, one said it wouldn't be interesting. Uh, so, all right, so your, your issue is, you know, what fellowship does life have with darkness? So the idea, I mean, there's a number of things you could say, but the other thing is that, look, Makes them just on general principles, and I can't spend too much time on it now. But if Masonry is, by its very creed, a false religion that says it's sufficient, uh, giving lending any credibility to it by you know your your presence there, um, question is how much are you authenticating it for someone else? How much are you um, doing those kinds of things? For, for plus the fact that how would you? Well, it's X Y Z. Well. I don't see how a Christian in good faith, since we believe Jesus is the light of the world, he's the only way of the salvation, can then go into the Masons as an entered apprentice and say, I'm in darkness seeking light and acknowledging that this is the highest form of, of revelation and religion uh, and knowing God. Uh, those are just contradictory notions. So, so, so the fact that they're mutually contradictory um, and the fact that, look, I'm not going to validate anything that does with false religion. That's why a number of denominations say you can't be a Christian and a Mason simultaneously. But the other question is, well, but yeah, but we don't really believe all that stuff. It's just a social club for us. Well, but why don't you just form another social club that doesn't have all the baggage attached to it? You know, uh, start a Christian social club or, you know, something that doesn't have all the secret society deistic sufficiency associated with it. Huh? Yeah, go to something else if you want a club. The whole point is, is you know, if you want, there's godly men's associations. You can either start, you know, go to the Christian Businessmen Association. You know, there's, there's, there's all sorts of things you can become members of, or even a Rotary Club. You know, they don't make doctrinal statements. You know, so there's all sorts of things you can get involved with that don't involve anything to do with doctrinal compromise. So that's what I'd say. Yeah. With what? What was the third one? Albion. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're well, and good. It depends on the agnostic. That's a problem. If you're trying to witness to Richard Dawkins or, you know, somebody like that, they're probably going to need a little, you know, fact is, is look, he's heard it all. He's seen, you know, the most deepest scholastic. He just doesn't want to listen. Um, what if someone's not so deep? Yeah. Like Yeah. Well, you know, um, Scott Smith's couple of books he's done on postmodernism and naturalism, things like that. Those are helpful. Um, can't remember the exact titles for that right now, but the uh, skepticism, uh, I'll tell you, don't even need a book, but uh, um, a lot of our guys in our departments, you know, philosophy departments at Talbot or here, um, think about some of the works that are available. I, I, I recommend if all of you could get it, if you haven't taken epistemology, because that's really what skepticism is, it's an, epi it's an epistemological stance. Now you can get books like, you know, Poyman's Theory of Knowledge, which is this thick, and try and wade through it. Uh, you can get stuff like that. But what I highly recommend is that, uh, you know, in our series here, um, uh, I don't even know if it's part of the Defending the Face series, but I know uh, whenever we started this stuff 10 or 15 years ago, uh, Dr. Moreland, did a tape. It's like, you know, it's one of those two and a half, three hour lectures. We pitched with everything dealing with the skeptic. And he pretty much gave you an entire course in epistemology in two and a half hours that specifically deals with refuting skepticism. And I'm trying to think the exact um, uh, name of the, the disc or the, the, the message that he gave, but uh, I think it's just called Refuting the Skeptic and the Case for Religious Knowledge or something like that. And he did two versions of it. The older one focused more on refuting the skeptic and less on religious knowledge. And then the second one had less on the first and more on the second. Is that more for us or is that a tradition for them? Oh, no, it's, it's, for, it's for us, but it's for, it's for us to use as a tool uh, to I get... 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd even get that so people can listen for two and a half hours to something. You know, hey, refute this guy. Boom. You know, deal with that. I right, go ahead. You know, put a, put a challenge to him. But the other thing too is like all everybody here has got to learn some kind of basic epistemology. How do we know things are true, and how to refute the false things that are keeping people from believing? So how do you refute postmodernism? How do you refute skepticism? I said there's a long way, and then there's sort of a which eventually dealing with every possible objection, and then there's dealing with it as a basic idea like postmodernism. That's actually pretty easy. If you say there's no truth and we're trapped by our perspectives, then you tell them, well, then be quiet, all right? You know, talk, stop trying to tell me the truth that there is no truth. Uh, you know, stop saying language is inadequate to convey knowledge by using language to tell, him, for, to tell me that language is inadequate to convey knowledge. Uh, you know, just literally sit there and be quiet, all right? I, I, that's what I don't get is you take a class on postmodernism by a postmodern professor at a university that you actually get a grade. I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, or how do you get anything less than 100 on your paper? You know, you can say, you know, pigs oink while flying, you know, and the answer to the question is, that, well, that's my interpretation. And according to you, you can't even know what I said, you know, my authorial intent. So but it's that goofy, but, you know, some of the types of skepticism that are around there, it's a little more difficult because you're looking at, you know, how particularism and foundationalism works as a theory of knowledge as opposed to Methodism and, uh, uh, you know, empiricism and these others that, you know, what's the use of criteria and knowledge and how does that work? And, uh, you know, th those, those are the bigger issues. But that's why I said you can get an epistemology text or you can get something that's fairly simple like that. So, so I'd, I'd suggest that. The rest of them will have to wait because I want to get back to the lecture here. But those are good, good questions. One thing, one thing I do have is I have a number of bibliographies that have recommended works in this area. They're all trapped in the Hades of my computer right now, trying to you know, restore all my files right now. So um, I'm about ready to put some three-in-one oil on my old drive and uh, um, deal with it. So eventually I'll, I'll get all that restored and re-index it and everything. And basically you can, uh, I'll post some of these bibliographies on the web page. I've got one for church state studies, study of theology, and you name it, in a lot of these different areas. So it depends who. It depends who, what, how much they want to listen. Um, you know, I, I just say LDS, you know, the Zonovan Guide to Cults and Religious Movement, you know, here. D but it depends who at what stage they're at in their Mormonism and you know if they need a more if they think they're Scott if they think they themselves think they're scholarly Mormons you know I'd give um, the Beckwith Mosier book on uh, uh, you know the uh, the one I signed for the spiritual formation more religions class uh, so and again there are some you know very more narrowly focused issues on you can't have eternal matter there's no, you know, evidence in Semitic culture, you know, for the Book of Mormon, and there's nothing Semitic in the Book of Mormon whatsoever. It's a little more refined and scholarly, but some people aren't even at that level. You know, you get someone who's already a seeker, you know, well, here, you know, read it, read this stuff, and if they're already open, here's some basic evidence that if they're willing to consider it, they'll change their mind, you know, at, at that fundamental level. Uh, someone who wants to look at some deeper issues, uh, James White, wrote a book called It's the Mormon, My Brother, and he really focused on two things. Uh, you know, what, what represents Mormonism? And the second question is the Mormon God versus the Christian God. That's it. The entire book focuses on those two things. So, so it all depends where the person's at. That's why the recommendation would be different uh, on those. And if they can't read, you won't give them anything. So, uh, you know, some, sometimes that's an issue. So, all right, let's move on now. The few minutes we have left here, I mean, I'll probably may finish this up tomorrow, but interdenominational theologies, and I'll probably have to quickly go through this, but um, what this means is these are, now you're hearing things like what's fundamentalism, what's liberalism, what's evangelicalism, and see these ideas can be found in multiple Christian denominations, hence they're interdenominational theologies, as opposed to denominational theologies. So, in this case, um, it starts with what we think about, if you had to conceptually do it, 
again, we're Protestant university, so we're not going to go back to, you know, 2,000 years. We're going to start the Reformation and say, here's, here's who we are. We're assuming all the universal truths from the first century on. And, but when we think about this and really what, who we are as cultures and churches and 17th century Protestant orthodoxy. All right. So here we're going well, and whether it's Methodism or whether it's, uh, you know, Presbyterianism or whether it's Arminianism, whatever it happens to be. Um, so what do we have now? So that's 17th century. And then the problem was the 18th century. OK, and what was the 18th century? The Enlightenment, which should be spelled with four letters, right? Because it wasn't really an Enlightenment. Uh, that actually sent us into darkness, didn't enlighten us. So, so the basic problem of the 18th century mainly was a new epistemology, okay? David Hume, right? David Hume uh, and all the others that said we can't have direct knowledge of God anymore. Hence now uh, scripture as our source of knowledge for God proposition is now no more. So now, because of this methodology, we're reducing Christianity to ethical monotheism. That's what you can know from natural theology. And how do we know? Well, the Bible says there's a natural theology. Romans 1, we know God exists. Romans 2, his law is written on our heart. Okay? So basically, you can, be, you can get from nature ethical monotheism. Okay? What you can't get is Christianity. The problem is, is now we have our universities, trust funds, denominations, and everything else now that, and again, be careful here. I just gave a lecture on this and uh, went to Poland a couple of weeks ago, um, is that disguised as apologetic method, disguised as a evangelism method is we have to make Christianity relevant to the culture. Okay. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. Danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Okay. Uh, no, I mean, see now th there is a way to understand that properly and there's a way to improperly understand that. But see, that whole phrase, making Christianity relevant to the culture, that's a type of apologetic method because this is what the culture will believe. So I want to put Christianity in a form that's reasonable to them, that they'll accept. So it's a skewed form of what, quote, reasonable faith would be. Now, Here's the difference, though, okay? Correlation method versus contextual method of theology. Okay, the biblical view is contextual, which is to do what? To take the unchanging propositions and ideas of Scripture and to communicate them in a way that the culture will understand. Now that could be, what's the culture? That could be everything from anybody trying to teach five-year-olds the faith. That's a culture. And by the way, you know, and here's the problem at your church. Do you just let, we let pretty much anyone teach our kids, right? You know, it's as they get older, that's when we need people with more training, right? Oh, okay, so it's okay to go in and teach my kids heresy uh, that I have to correct later. Yeah, no, no, no. Guess what? You need training in Bible and theology. You just need to know how to translate for five-year-olds five year in a way they'll understand. That, that's a very important ministry. I spent half my life for the last 15 years, sadly, I, people, you know, my kids go into their youth ministry, and every time they come back, what'd you learn? I'm, no, no, no. All right, here's the way it's really supposed to be. All right. So again, I made sure I discipled my kids, and we had our you know, every night from the time they were 18 months old, it was like, okay, kids, how many gods are there? One. How many persons are God? Three. Doesn't it make three gods? No, only one. Good answer, kids. All right. So um, now what if someone says Jesus is not God? That is egregious heresy, daddy. Yeah. So, yes, you have answered correctly, son. So, yes, you have done well. So, but literally it's like, you know, Again, well-meaning people, somehow we think it's okay to teach, you know, you don't have to know anything to teach kids. No, I, you spend your time correcting false ideas. You know, again, you don't want to spend your time, you don't, especially with your kids. You only get to lay a foundation once. It's really hard to break up the foundation and relay a new one. So that's why you want to be really careful, especially at the beginning, with whether someone's a new convert 
you know, they converted when they were older. Well, guess what? Make sure you get that foundation laid. Don't let them listen to Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and everyone else to get their initial teaching that you're going to have to fix later. So, uh, yeah, that becomes a problem. So, again, contextualization, again, cross-cultural, you know. You're here and you're going to go to, you know, some other culture or language. You can't change what the Bible says, but you've got to know how to communicate it. Uh, for example, you go to a non uh, again, a, a non-pastoral kind of community. For someone who's never seen a herd of sheep, how do you explain all we like sheep have gone astray? Cats. Yeah, how, all we like cats have gone astray, you know? <laughs> that's right, that's good. So, uh, yeah, I like that. So, uh, yeah, sheep are dumb, cats are dumb. Yeah, yeah that, that's pretty good. I have to remember that. So, uh, yeah, so that's contextualization method. And... Um, See, what's the non-biblical way to do it, which is essentially how we uh, ruin the Protestant Reformation, and actually what's going on now with postmodernism, where we're ruining the evangelical movement. It's correlation method, okay? Which is, here's the reigning epistemology or metaphysic in the culture, and now we're actually gonna change the substance of Christianity to fit what the culture will believe, okay? It's exactly what happened with the modernist or liberal movement, okay? Now that the Enlightenment, quote unquote, got a hold of our academies, our universities, you know, now they're the smart people, and now this is, well, now Christianity has to adjust, okay? And what do we end up with? Like I said, we ended up with the gutting of our major Protestant denominations, and we had to start over again. So with our uh, fundamental evangelical renewal. Now, so that's where, so that we, we shifted into liberalism or modernism. And after 150 years of that, finally, they finally sort of got to the end of taking over our institutions and what we have to do. We either got kicked out, we weren't there anymore, or we decided we're just so ineffective, we have to start new ones, okay? So that's why, you know, for example, the last sort of of the Ivy League or, you know, old time ones was uh, in the 1920s when Princeton finally went over to neo-orthodoxy. That's when, you know, uh, J. Gresham Machen and others finally said, we're, they left and started, you know, you know Westminster Seminary. But see, the problem is, is you lost an entire university and went and started a seminary, okay? You know, and that's our problem now. See, as we're trying to preserve the faith, we lost our entire comprehensive academic, you know, uh, training centers. And each one of them are starting to go, whether it's law, medicine, philosophy, everything else, it followed theology and what was acceptable. And so now we've got, you know, Westminster Seminary, we've got Biola, we've got Multnomah, you know, Wheaton, you know, but the big ones, where we spent the money on, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you name it, you know, they're still in the hands of, you know, people who aren't doing this. Um, now, of course, Biola, here we are 105 years later. Well, we have more than a Bible college now, but I've been bugging our trustees here for years. You know, where's our law school or medical school or school of government or engineering school? And, you know, you know how, how do we train every walk of life and especially the leadership positions in the culture? You know, uh, so that's the problem. You know, Wheaton, you know, college, university, you know, seminaries are still seminaries. But our problem is we don't have a comprehensive vision. You know, true university is to take universe, un take all knowledge and put it in one place and have a co uh, an under uh, <laughs> have an integrated knowledge system based around who Christ is and what God has said. So, so anyway, so that's a little bit. But see. But when you're kicked out and you're fighting for your lives just to preserve the faith, that's where we move to the first, one of the first reactions to liberalism, um, fundamentalism and neo-orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy in a nutshell was a halfway house where Karl Barth is the main name associated with neo-orthodoxy, where here Barth affirmed most of the old Protestant doctrines but then at the same time, he's affirmed a lot of the modern critical scholarship and the critique of Bart and Bartianism and neo-orthodoxy was, you can't get all of this authoritative doctrine from flawed scripture. But see, what he was doing was taking the existentialist philosophy of the early 20th century and saying, well, revelation is existential encounter with God. So it's experience we have with God. 
okay, well, what's the Bible now? Well, it's a witness to Revelation. People have these encounters with God and they wrote about their experiences. Yeah, but how is the Bible binding on my conscience as opposed to, since it's not Revelation, it's just a witness to Revelation. So Bard affirmed much of, of orthodoxy, not all of it, but, it, but the critique of him was that you, you can't get these propositions from a non-authoritative propositions from a non-authoritative scripture, okay? Ultimate critique. Then fundamentalism, two kinds. Doctrinal fundamentalism is going back and reaffirming this. We've got to go and save the faith and reaffirm the essence of Christianity, okay? That was our doctrinal fundamentalism. <laughs> Problem is after 20, 30 years of this, it turned into a cultural fundamentalism, right? Where while we preserve the faith, if you recall, you know, what's happening now, well, where are the people in law and medicine and culture and politics and all these areas? Well, where we had this before, now we're stuck. We sort of bar up the doors of the church from the inside and don't look out. Uh, now, for a while, we were trying to do this, but remember 1920s, remember the Scopes trial? Huh. Not that you were there, I hope not, but, um, <laughs> but uh, Scopes trial, that was all about what? You know, whether or not the Christians are smart or the evolutionists are smart. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that because we're still hurting from the result of the Scopes trial. Those of you in the science and religion program, we're still reeling from our bad showing at the Scopes trial because this was really the trial of the century because what was he, and here's some instruction for us, what was that all about? Well, it's because actually Tennessee had a law that forbade the teaching of evolution, right? And by the way, that wasn't a constitutional issue at the time because the federal government had absolutely nothing to say about religion in the states. So, so this was about, you know, the, it was basically a show trial, which against, you know, against the guy, you know, he, he lost scopes. He taught evolution. He lost the trial. So we won, but we lost. Why? Because, you know, they had a tent outside with, you know, two or 3,000 reporters in. It was like, who's winning? Who, who are the smart people, the science people, who are the atheist evolutionist or the Christians, okay? And in the end, what happened is that uh, William Jennings Bryan, who was a, actually a presidential candidate, you know, Bible preacher, everything else, who actually, you know, took on the case, he went against the defense attorney. And the problem is, is that Bryan put himself on the stand as the, as the expert witness in the science areas. And as people, as he was cross-examined by the real, he was made to look like a fool. He couldn't answer some of the most basic questions about these things. And so everybody, literally some of the answers, the, the, the people who were really trying to think about this, it was just laughable, some of the answers they gave. So what, what was reported was that Christianity can't, is not intellectual, it can't defend the doctrine of creation and all of that. And that's what's widely reported now. Why? Because we had the wrong representative in the debate, okay? And I've seen this happen a couple of times, same way, when I was at Whittier Law School doing my law degree, uh, and it was 2000, it was my second year there. That's when the whole debate over Prop 22, they're trying to pass Prop 22, which defined it, it was going to pass the uh, California, was going to amend the California Family Code to saying marriage is only between one man, one woman. And even though that eventually passed and then it was overturned, and actually next week we're probably going to get a ruling on Prop 8 uh, and all that coming to an end. I'll tell you what happened. I was at Whittier Law School. They sponsored a debate on the issue of homosexuality and uh, uh, homosexual marriage. And they had a guy who was a homosexual, practicing attorney, constitutional law person. And then the guy that came to debate him on the you know, anti-homosexual marriage side was a good Christian man, and he was sort of a, a values person. But in the end, again, we're sitting there at a law school. This guy came in to debate. The guy just fried him on the legal And by the time all the Christians were going, oh, gosh. And everybody was laughing at the guy as being an idiot guy. And again, he was a nice man. 
He was probably good with the faith. He had no idea about what law was all about. And you ask him earlier, it's dozens of questions. What about this? I don't know. Well, it's Adam and Steve, not Adam and Eve. Well, that wasn't the question. And see, even the people who were seeking an answer at that point, they finally went, that's the best you can do? <laughs> yeah, right. So much for Christianity. I saw that happen before my eyes where you had the radicals there that nothing was going to change their mind, but you also had some seekers there. And they were really looking for someone to give an answer at that point. And we had the wrong person doing that. And this has happened a number of times, you know, in these public debates. So if you ever take a debate with someone, make sure you win. OK. Um, we don't have yeah. Our problem is, is we are here 80 years out right now, 90 years out from this. And we're still trying to get our place back in the public square on this, you know, Dover trial 2005. We can't even mention intelligent design in the classroom. So, so this is what, you know, it's not that we don't have the goods now. The problem is we just want a chance to make our case, uh, so which we don't. So anyway, we're done for the day. So I'll pick up on this tomorrow. So see you all tomorrow. Bring your theology proper handouts, uh, one, two, and three, and we'll see you then.